making him sound like he's the best attorney general. And there's lies, lies, lies. I'm a child of an immigrant. I'm a union worker. I'm a person of color. I'm a woman. What happened? Bullshit. What happened in the hearing room? Bullshit. They're making this session sound like he is not evil. We are outside the confirmation hearing for Senator Jeff Sessions to be Attorney General where a protester was just arrested and uh, escorted out down the hallway by the police and taken out of here for reasons uh, that she said were, quote, bullshit. She said that Senator Jeff Sessions is entirely unqualified to become Attorney General. The vote has been set for tomorrow morning. It looks like he has enough Republicans to support him to move him through, no matter what Democrats don't do, unless they don't show up. And that's what I wanted to talk about briefly here. Something remarkable, at least by Senate standards, happened today. And that was at two different hearings, one, one for Tom Price, for HHS Secretary, and another for Steve Mnuchin, for Treasury Secretary, Democrats simply didn't show up for the hearing. And if they don't show up, it doesn't mean that Republicans can just say yes to the nominee and put it through a committee. There's a rule that you have to have a quorum. You have to have a certain number of members there, and you have to have at least one from each party in order to hold a hearing. Because of that, they couldn't have a hearing. About a half an hour, uh, Senator Orrin Hatch from Utah, Republican chairman of this committee, came out, said it was offensive, uh, said it was pathetic, said he was insulted that Democrats would have done this. But the reason it's important is that Democrats would not think on their own to boycott a hearing. This is not an idea that occurs to a typical elected Democratic official. This is something that they only have thought of today as a result of the pressure that's been applied to them over the past several uh, weeks, but per particularly in the last week, beginning with the Women's March, uh, culminating with the, all of the, uh, the spontaneous protests over the weekend. And it, it reminds you of a certain political reality. One is that a lot of people say that you should take Donald Trump seriously, but not literally, or literally, but not seriously. It's become a cliche in the campaign. But the Republican Party, in an interesting way, takes its base seriously, but not literally. In other words, the Republicans very much respect and listen to their base, to what, what's now called the Tea Party base, or, the, or, or now, they're, now they're more Trump supporters, or before, kind of just evangelical Christians, whatever it was, they, they respected the power of that base. Now, they didn't take them literally. The base might say, don't cut Medicare and Social Security. They would still, through their ideology, want to cut Social Security and Medicare. But they, but they respected their power and, and would try to find ways to channel that power to to benefit them and put, put them in power. Democrats never have quite done that in generations. And Democrats instead look at their base as something that's going to show up for them, except a marginal few will vote for third party candidates and, uh, and occasionally it bites Democrats like in 2000. But they see the base as more something to appease rather than something where they can derive ideas from, energy from, to take them uh, and, and put them in power and then enact those ideas. And that's been a difference between the two parties over the, over the last several decades. But today, you, you saw that change ever so slightly, uh, partly as a result of Democrats having nothing left. They have exhausted every possible option other than listening to their base. Uh, you know, they, they've, they've, they've lost the Senate, they've lost the House, they're losing the Supreme Court, they don't have the White House, they've lost th three quarters plus of state legislatures and governorships. So the last thing they have is their base but believe it or not, they're actually listening. And as a result, last night, they held a rally. They even tried to figure out how to use a bullhorn. And today, they boycotted a couple of hearings. So will it work? We don't know. But Democrats are actually trying something for once. David Shapiro, watching on Facebook Live, would like to know if you compare this to a coup, what's happened with the Republican Party. Uh, and the, I guess he's, he's talking about right. Russia, maybe. I, I mean, so a coup is. Coup is a, a, a difficult word to use because you don't want to sap it of its strength when an actual coup happens, where uh, let's, let's say Congress is dissolved or the Supreme Court is dissolved um, and in, in, in its place are installed uh, you know, the, the, the leader, the Donald Trump's staff, or let's say. And so I, you do have to be very careful about going too far in using, in using those words. The Customs and Border Patrol has been very either lax in enforcing some, ju some court orders or they have been refusing to enforce them or they've been dragging their feet on it depending on, depending on who you ask. That does bring you to the brink of a constitutional crisis, but I would not yet 
call it a coup. Okay, um, they want you to recap exactly yeah. where Jeff Sessions stands right now. Sure, Je Jeff, Jeff Sessions, the uh, his yeah, final right. hearing adjourned uh, two o'clock this afternoon, just, just minutes ago, and he, uh, most Democrats, if not all, are, are opposed to his nomination. All Republicans are supporting his nomination, which means that uh, if the vote goes off as planned tomorrow morning, uh, as I expect it will, because he's a senator and so they're less likely to boycott his hearing, then he'll have enough votes to pass and get to the Senate floor. Uh, you, th at that point, you'd have to find three Republicans who are willing to vote no, and that's going to be extraordinarily difficult. What do you anticipate is going to be the legal landscape if Jeff Sessions is the Attorney General and many of the cases that are working their way up to the Supreme Court on voting rights, um, does, it, does the Justice Department jump off or do they jump on the other side or what happens? So Jeff Sessions as Attorney General flips on its head our understanding of the way that the legal system operates in, a, you know, in, in our system of government. It, you know, the Attorney General has always been the, the country's lawyer, you know, the government's lawyer, not the president's lawyer. And so if the attorney general's legal reasoning differs from the president, the attorney general goes forward uh, with their reasoning rather than the president's. Donald Trump has a habit of referring to Jeff Sessions or, or to the position itself as quote unquote, my attorney general. And that's a, that's a point that Dianne Feinstein made, not at all a liberal. Uh, it's a point that she made in, in announcing uh, that she was going to vote no. She's the highest ranking uh, Democrat on, on the committee. So it, it changes the role. It, it makes the Attorney General subservient to and subordinate to the President, which takes away one of the few checks. And th to, to the question, I think yes, uh, the Department of Justice uh, will, will reevaluate a lot of cases that it's involved with if they are, uh, you know, if they're suing a locality that might be. Um, you know, complicit in, in some type of police violence or uh, a any number of other cases where uh, the, the politics of, D of Donald Trump or the Republican Party might be on the other side, then you could easily see the Department of Justice uh, slowly walking away from those cases or, or reversing itself. However, you have a, a ton of career lawyers uh, who are still in the Department of Justice who are going to push forward uh, with, these, with, with these cases. Now, I've talked to some of those lawyers uh, in DOJ, and the way that they say that this often works is that they just kind of bury them under memos. So, so, you, so you say, you, you file a memo in February, and you say, this is how we should bring you know, this city to heel when it comes to police violence. And they'll come back to you and say, this is great. Uh, on page four, I've got a question about this. Give, give me a memo on that. Give it to me in March. Uh, in March, you send in that page, you say, oh, I've got a question about this. You know, don't rush. Get it to me by July. July, uh, then, then you've got August, everybody's on vacation, now you're getting closer to midterms. L well, let's, you know, let's shelve this until uh, we get back from the new year and the midterms. Now you're in the presidential cycle. Give me another couple paragraphs on this. And four years have gone by and the police violence continues and the Department of Justice has, has done nothing, but there's no story that says Department of Justice blocks invest, you know. So, th you know, we have to be on the lookout for that sort of thing. And it's difficult to report, but that's, that's what we're here to do.